and always know My name is Sue Skasky with Vermont Volunteer Services for Animals Humane Society and welcome to our show for the animals. Today we're on site in Chelsea, Vermont with Deb Baker. She's the president of the Hooved Animal Sanctuary here in Chelsea and it is gorgeous here. Yeah. You, I mean, not only is this like being on top of the world, it's, it's beautiful, it's immaculate, it's spacious, it's clean and the horses outside look wonderful. That's the volunteers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for doing this show. Yeah. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Um, you opened Hooved Animal Sanctuary. I mean, Hooved Animal Sanctuary, yeah, yeah, in January of 2003. Correct. That's You've been at it a long time. Yeah. Yes, we have. With a mission to rescue and rehabilitate abused and neglected horses with the goal of placing them in lifelong loving homes. Thank you for allowing us to do this show. Thanks. So, yeah, well. um, I understand that you started your love affair with horses when you were nine years old, right? Yeah, I uh, I loved them from out, you know from the beginning. Yeah. But I started riding um, with lessons when I was nine, and from there I just continued on and just made it my career. Did you have horses that you lived with when you were young? My uncle had a dairy farm, so there were always some old work horses hanging around. So I was always shinning up a leg and getting on <laughs> while he was milking. Um, and then after a while, my parents leased a couple horses for me uh -huh. um, so I could continue. Okay. Um, you've worked and you've trained, I understand, under some pretty um, well-known people in the yeah. country. Could yeah. you talk about that? Well, I've been fortunate that um, there was a period of time where I just took off and toured the country and worked um, at different stables with different trainers. Um, Quarter horses? As, at first it was event horses, um, thoroughbred type horses, and then I got into the paints and the quarters. Okay, for somebody that doesn't know horses real well, what are event horses, paints, and quarters? Well, your event horses are your English jumping dressage type horses. Um, they do a lot of that around here, actually. I have to tell you something. The other day I was at work in Woodstock and a woman there does horse training and care and one of her horses was out in the field all by himself doing dressage. Oh really? <laughs> Peg and I was, look at the horse, yeah. he was just having a ball uh -huh. all by himself. Yeah. Well it's natural, I mean basically they, you're not really teaching them to do anything they don't already know. Okay. It's just um, getting to them to do it when you ask them. So. Do you teach dressage? I do not do dressage anymore myself, per se, the English dressage. Um, I use a lot of the basic training techniques of dressage, um, but I don't compete in the dressage world. What would a basic dressage training technique be? Um, well, they do a lot of um, collecting them and putting them on the bit and framing them up so that they car it's a self-carriage type mo movement. Um, I show Western horses, and they also have to have self-carriage and collection. It's just a different look. Okay. So. And the difference between Western and English? Um, the saddle is the biggest thing people notice. Okay. Um, the little English saddle, people call it a shingle. It's as far as I know, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the horn. And the Western has the horn, and the, yeah. the cowboys um, are the ones that usually ride in the western saddles. Okay. But I prefer western now over English. I just find it more comfortable. Yeah. And a lot of your trail riders like the western saddle. Now, can horses be 
Western and English? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, when I show my quarter horses, I, I show all around, which means English and Western. Um, so I'm versed in both. So you've been all over the country. Yeah. Yeah, I spent a lot of years in Texas um, learning the Western pleasure horses and then the cutting and the reining horses um, performance. Okay, what are reining horses? Uh, reining horses are, are horses that are trained to do a specific um, patterns when they're being shown where they they run hard, stop hard, turn around, spin. Um, it's really a physical physical sport along with the cutting horses have the same athletic ability. They have to move fast, cat-like movements. So, how I, is that something for younger horses? A lot of your horses start out as um, two, three, three-year-olds. They have futurities for them where they, that's their first show they go to. And um, then from there they build. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, before the show, I was walking around and looking at the different horses. How many do you have here right now? We have 11 on the property right now. Wow, Dad. Yeah, and not all of them are the rescue horses. We have um, two boarders, and then I have um, one and a baby that are mine. I saw that little one out there. Yeah. What a cutie. Yeah, that's my, um, my next project. Hopefully she will be my next show horse that will take me down the road for many years. And how old is she? She's four months old. Okay. Horses normally live to be? Oh, gosh, now we're seeing them into their 30s. So they, they have a long life if they're taken care of. I can imagine that horses are extremely expensive to provide care for. Yeah, that's, that's one of the problems we're seeing is people financially cannot keep their horses anymore. How much do you figure it costs to feed a horse or take care of a horse for one year? Um, I always figure ourselves about $2,400 a year. Um, that's including your, your shoeing and your vet work and your dental care. Um, and that's for a healthy horse. If you have problems and have, need medical attention, your cost could go way up. I can imagine. I mean, small companion animals are so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Are all the horses that are here now, do they all come from rescue? Um, six are rescue horses that are on the property right now. And we have two out in foster care. Okay, so how do you hear about animals that are in need of rescue? Or, or that are neglected or whatever? Yeah. Um, the public will call us directly if they see something that doesn't look quite right. Law enforcement, if they get a call into the um, sheriff's office, they will call us and ask us to check it out. And then there is a um, statewide database called reportanimalcruelty.com that the public can go to and they can anonymously um, write the complaint. And then it goes to whatever county that it is in and like, we'll go out in Orange County. That's our county we'll check out everything that comes in through there. So is that just for horses only or is that for all animals? It's lot. We do just large animals. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that do dogs and cats and the smaller animals, so we are basically just large animals. Okay, but that report animal cruelty, that's for any breed, any species rather? Yes, it, can, it covers any animal that's being neglected or, or if somebody has a question that it looks a little shaky. Okay. What's your phone number, Deb, in case people needed to reach out to you? Ours is 802-685-7767. Uh, um, it's on our website, which is hooved.org, and uh, they can call us directly. Okay. I know that Hooved Animal Sanctuary is the lead agency in Orange County. Um, do you have volunteers that help you with investigations or... We do have um, six trained volunteers at this point, and they've taken the um, investigation classes over at the state police barracks over in the Rutland area. Um, and there are five levels, I believe, right now that you, we ask people to complete mm -hmm. before they go out with us. And then they go out with um, myself or my other head agent, and we sort of break them in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, just before we started, we were discussing Title 13, Chapter 8, which are the statutes for animal protection. And specifically, let's read one 
that deals with the shelter of animals. Do you have that? Yeah. Um, it says it should be adequate natural shelter or a three-sided roofed building with exposure out of the prevailing wind and of sufficient size to adequately accommodate all livestock maintained out of doors. And then we were talking about what natural shelter is. Um, I know that at the place that I spoke of earlier in Woodstock, just looking outside last week at the mid-October, it was a little chilly out, not brutal, but the horses all had coats on, and this place is absolutely pristine. And I spoke to the woman with regard to her feelings on natural shelter, and she said, absolutely not for her. Mm -hmm. Her horses have a be their beautiful stables. But you and I were talking about different breeds of horses and where for some, mind you, not the horses general to Vermont, I wouldn't think, with our Morgan and mm. everything, but what are the breeds that... The Icelandic horses or the fjords, um, they're horses that have double and triple coats. So they are actually designed to withstand um, severe weather. Okay, how about um, Morgans and other horses? Do they get the triple coat? They don't get the triple coat. Um, if a horse is well cared for and fed well, they will get a nice fluffy coat that will protect them from a lot of the elements. Mm -hmm. But um, natural shelter really needs to be something like a thick stand of of pine trees where they're all intertwined and it will shed the elements. You were talking about really uh, sort of like an igloo yeah, creation it, yeah. if that were yep. to be. And, and they have to be all be able to get under there and you can tell if they're standing under there and they're happy and content and they look like they're just hanging out, they're, they're doing well. But if they're under there and they're shivering and they're all humped up um, and they're still getting wet, that's not working. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I know that we got a we had a call come in last week about a horse in the cold rain without any protective garment and there was no facility mm -hmm. at all, no shed, no barn. So our investigator gave her notice that immediately she had to have something mm -hmm. put up, which she intended to do, but yeah. you know, things get ahead of you, but we're in the summertime they might be fine, except mm -hmm. they do need some protection from the sun. Yeah, the sun and the, and the bugs. Um, the bugs right. tend to be the worst for the animals. You get some of those bot flies that chase the horses around, they'll just run themselves ragged trying to get away. If they have a you know, dark or a, a area where it's a little bit darkened, they'll get under there and the, the flies won't go under. And a bot fly is? It's just a big old it's fly and, it's an, and it gets on them and it just lays an egg on them. And they're nuisance. Yeah. And that makes the great horses crazy. Do they go under the skin? They don't. No, they'll lay their eggs on top of their the hair on their legs. Um, and then the horse will, you know, get it on their nose and ingest it. And then the bots will be internal. Wow. Yeah. So they're, they're just not a very friendly worm. Yeah. Okay. Um... I want to go back to the investigations. Mm -hmm. Do you always have to remove the animals that you investigate? No. When we go out, we really try to educate the owners and have them comply with what we suggest, um, be it shelter or more feed or, or get a veterinarian to come in and evaluate and give them some kind of a protocol to um, improve the conditions. We do not want to take anybody's animals. But if we give them the time needed to comply and we find that they don't when we go back for a checkup, then we will proceed with um, seizure or trying to get the animals rehomed or moved. There, was, um, there were two horses two years ago, I think it was, or maybe it was last year, and they'd been out in the fields and their manes were so tight, tied up with burrs. It was just, oh my God, this is never going to... And I talked to my veterinarian who said, that's very painful. And we talked with Deb. And shortly thereafter, and we, I'm going to try and get before and after pictures put in there, you intervened and the horses looked beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and that was just a matter of talking with the owner and just saying, you know, this just isn't right. And they were fine. They just said, you know, we'll get after it. Yeah. 
What do you find the biggest challenges to doing investigations? Right now, we're finding that we're doing investigations of large numbers of animals on a property. Uh, we used to go in and there'd be one or two horses and most of the time we'd be able to work with the owner and get it changed. Now we're going in where there's 14, 15, 16 horses on a property. These people are collecting them. They don't have the finances or the means to take care of them and provide what these animals need. So when we go in and we work with the owner and they're not going to comply, you know, then we're, we're dealing with trying to seize 14, 15 horses and find a place to put them. We also have a ticketing system, though, where um, a law enforcement agency can go in and for lack of food, adequate food, water, shelter, sanitation, or medical attention, can write a civil ticket. Right. Have you used that process? Um, a few times we have, and that has worked because it, it puts a little fear in the owner and they usually step up to the plate Yeah. if they're the kind that are on the fence. Right. Yeah, well, if I knew I was looking at a ticket with a hefty fee behind it, yeah, yeah, I'd step quickly. Well, that's what I said. I said, take that fine and put it towards food for your horse. Yeah. Um, so what's the most common complaint that you get? Uh, lack of shelter is the biggest one this time of year now, coming into the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even in the summer, we'll get people that say the horses are standing out in a bare pasture without any way to get on, you know, under the trees. So that uh, seems to be the worst one. Educate me. In the summertime, does the diet change for a horse from the summer to the winter? Well, around here, um, a lot of people have pasture. Mm -hmm. So the horse can go out, and if you've got a horse that's a healthy, easy, we call them easy keeper, um, they can do fine on just water and good grass, uh, maybe a little supplement, um, vitamin if they need it. In the winter, um, we need good hay, good water, um, and sometimes the horses will need a little extra grain to support their weight. Do you um, feed grain in the summer? Most of my horses I do not feed grain to in the summer unless they're animals that have come in that were in starvation state. Okay. Then we do, um, we have a protocol for starting them on alfalfa, working them up, and then um, getting them on a grain to get their weight back up. Usually once they're, they're healthy again, they do pretty well just on the hay and grass. Mm -hmm. I remember, oh, this is going back at least 15 years ago, we did a case with a woman that had a horse in her backyard and she had an electric fence around it. There was not a blade of grass in the yard and the poor horse had grass right over mm -hmm. the electric fence. It was torturous for yeah. that poor thing. Mm -hmm. It was... Um, yeah, and I, I don't know what goes through people's minds sometimes. I don't either. <laughs> Gave up figuring that out a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. Um, okay, so do you adopt out, out horses? Uh -huh. After they're, um, they're healthy and we've had time to evaluate what their training level is, um, if they're an animal that's been trained and just needs to be tuned up and ready to ride, we usually can find homes for them. A lot of the horses that come here come with emotional and poor training and poor handling problems. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, um, you know, get them so that they're safe um, and people can work with them and, and do something. Do you have an adoption fee? Yep, we do. We have a sliding fee. Um, just depends on the training level that the horse has. If it's a sound horse and can be ridden, or if it's a horse that can just be a companion horse. Mm -hmm. Those all vary. And does that fee cover the cost of your care of the animal? Generally not. I'm, uh, I'll bet not. Um, I mean, I look at it that when we rescue a horse and it steps on our trailer, we have $500 that goes into that horse right away. That's farrier, dental, um, vet, bit, um, you know, the vet comes out and does blood work, mm -hmm. has vaccinations, then you got to feed it for 30, 60, 90 days to get it back up to where it needs to be, and then you got to start the training process. Sure. So that's a lot of money. So you're a nonprofit? Yes, we are. Okay. Fundraising. Oh, I know fundraising is always so energy draining. Yeah. And you're doing it all. I mean, you have your horses here, you've got your grounds upkeep. Yep. In, atten in addition to the care that you're providing for the animals, you somehow have to find the money. Yeah. Yeah, that's always a struggle. Um, 
we do write some grants and, and then we have fundraisers, a few small fundraisers, and then we do an appeals letter um, in December and hope the public will give us a hand. I know that the Chelsea Bottle Drive is a big supporter. They are. They're Sheree great. Snook. Yeah. They are wonderful. They're yeah. the best hearted people and they have helped us a lot. And I know that Sheree and Snook would say, oh no, it's all the people that donate yeah. bottles. Yeah, absolutely. But I see out in the barn um, there's a stall with a plaque. Yep. Yes, they've, they've donated um, over the past years and they continue to be great supporters of us. And so we had a, a memorial dedication plaque put up on one of our stalls because they the money that they donated at that time went towards putting doors and the grill work on our stalls in yeah. our new barn. That's great. Do you um, encourage volunteers to come and help here? Yeah, we have a great volunteer program. We get a lot of kids that come in and you know learn. There's no riding when people come to volunteer, and that's a misconception. Everybody thinks they're going to ride. <laughs> there is no riding. Um, but there's the everyday grooming and cleaning water buckets and cleaning stalls and you know just the day-to-day -day stuff. Chores. Chores. Yeah. Chores to keep a place yep. in the shape. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, question, do you take in other animals besides horses? Well, when we started we thought that would be the way to go. Uh -huh. um, but right now we really focus on horses. Um, once in a while we'll get a goat or a pig that comes through, but we don't have the facilities to, to do anything more. Everything's really geared around horses. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you can think of that I might not have asked that you'd like to talk about? No, I think, I think we got it covered. Okay, so what I'm coming away with, horses need an awful lot of money to keep them yep. in good shape. Yep. It's not cheap. It is not cheap. What you're doing is truly an act that's of kindness, but it's also, you need deep pockets. Yes, you do. And people that go out and think that they're just going to get a free horse off of Craigslist and yeah. have it in their backyard for their kids, they have no clue. I always think horses have a short end of the stick. Oh, they do. People, you know, get animals, horses, and then their children outgrow them, and then they sell them, they give them away. And it, it just seems like a lot of people don't have that emotional attachment with a horse that they do with a cat or dog. And I always hear about horses being shipped yeah. off. Yeah. Well, you know, in years past, of course, we had auctions and the, we had slaughterhouses in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, around here, the auction houses have folded a lot. Um, is that a good thing? I think it is right now. Um, we definitely need a, a system where we can put these horses somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been a struggle. You know, the slaughter industry is not the place to send these horses. Right. Um, we've got to come up with a humane way to end these animals' lives. Right. And it, it's got to be humane. It's not putting them on a truck and sending them to Canada or Mexico. Right. Um, so, you know, that's that's a big issue. We have to work that out. I know there were two ponies that um, I inherited as part of care providing for somebody who passed away. And these ponies lived to be 40-something years yeah. old. And they were, they were very unique animals because they were backyard buddies. Yeah. They were never... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never ridden. Um, one was bossy over the other, yeah. but when it came time, only due to health reasons, that we had to put them down, it was a very emotional, hard thing. Yeah. But I cannot imagine shipping a horse off to slaughter and just saying, no. you know, your time is up. So that's yeah. something that, you know. Well, people go, you know, out of sight, out of mind. You know? Right. But I always tell people when they adopt a horse, I said, put $500 away somewhere. Because at some point, you are going to need that to do the right thing and have this horse humanely euthanized. Right. And um, you need to be ready for that. And you know the emotional toll. So I want to close by saying thank you so much for investing the emotional yeah. toll, not toll, but emotional vestment that you do for these animals knowing that you're caring for them for the long run. Yeah, we try to do our best. And it's been fun. 
Thank you, Deb. Thank you. So on behalf of Vermont Volunteer Services for Animals Humane Society, thank you for watching and please go online and look up Hooved Animal Sanctuary in Chelsea and consider supporting them, volunteer financially, um, fundraising, whatever. Yeah, anybody who's got any fundraising ideas, we're always open for suggestions. Okay, <laughs> there you go. So thank you, Deb. Thank you. And thank you for watching For the Animals.